sometimes when there are certain issues that happen, they say, hey, you all shouldn't think like that. It seems that Malaysia politics still can't run away from trying to be ultra-nationalist. Welcome to the Are We OK podcast, the podcast that talks about public policy issues in ways that are relevant and accessible to you guys. Uh, my name is Ken Ming. And I'm Peter from Mr. Money. How has your week been so far? Oh, for me, the week has been really a busy one. Uh, Any highlights? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think for one that really caught my attention was when uh, EPF showed uh, their results, right? Mm. Uh, I think one of the things that was really interesting is that uh, we all know the Malaysian market did not do very well, right? Yeah, but they actually managed to get quite good return. Overseas. S- simply just because from that foreign investment, right? And it's not a big portion of their their investment is a small portion. And it made um, me realize, right? Th- that 30 they are, plus percent. Yeah, they're they they actually really good with their job. Lah. Mm. I would say like EPF is really good with their job. That's one thing. Uh, number two, they also showed us uh, the birth rate in Malaysia. They were talking about how it's declining right now. Although it's not going to cause an immediate problem, but in future it is. Uh, further to be verified, uh, but if I recall correctly from the slide, they showed it was a 1.6% Mm. for uh, replacement yeah, ratio, to, right? Yeah. Just to give the audience uh, an idea, uh, replacement rate uh, is about 2.1, 2.2. Basically, you need to have, uh, you know, both parents produce two children uh, a bit mm. more because uh, of certain mortality uh, yeah. rates and all that kind of stuff. So, so the idea is that replace me yeah, and both my wife, of you, yeah, in correct, sense, correct. Right? Yeah. So anything yeah. below two uh, is uh, of concern, shows a the declining uh, population. And then 1.6, I think, is something for the government to, to think about and worry about. Mm, yeah. Uh, next thing is the Bank Negara one, but I think the one is uh, uh, a little bit more towards the economic side. Some good news is, yeah, based on a lot of the numbers, uh, we are going to be looking at some growth this year. So yeah. 4, point, 4 to 5% uh, yes. export growth will be healthier than last year. That's right. Yeah, I mean, uh, any sort of like questions from uh, the past episodes that, that you'd like to raise? Uh, maybe I can start first. Yeah. So there was um, a couple of questions that was raised, uh, you know, when we were doing the 1MDB uh, and also Najib's uh, discount uh, episode. Uh, and, and I think many of you pointed out that, you know, I sort of like gave very, uh, not much attention or, or rather didn't take the 160 million discount uh, very seriously. Uh, and of course, 160 million ringgit is a huge amount of money to any person, you know, especially uh, those, uh, you know, any, any, whether you're rich or poor, you say 160 million, you know, unless you have 2.6 billion in your bank account, that's, <laughs> that, that's going to be a lot of money. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the reason why I wanted to contextualize it as something that maybe in the larger scheme of things uh, is not uh, that significant is because, uh, you know, frankly speaking, if we had really wanted to save, uh, you know, money in terms of expenditure on the part of government, uh, there's actually a lot of other wastage that we can address uh, that we can... Uh, reduce uh, this kind of uh, an unnecessary expenditure and save easily save more than 160 mm. million. So, for example, the Ministry of Finance, uh, you know, they are currently deliberating uh, a bill called the Government Procurement Act. And what this act will do is it will put in a lot of limitations in terms of what direct negotiation contracts can be handed out mm. by ministers, by including the Minister of Finance. So it ties the hands of the politicians uh, not to be able to end the ministries, not to be able to make so many exceptions. Uh, and if let's say that can be, be deliberated and passed in parliament, uh, it would make a difference in terms of uh, making sure that uh, at least there are more uh, tenders, more open tenders, negotiated tenders, rather than a direct award of uh, these kinds of contracts, which yep. will cost the government a lot more than uh, the discount that was given to Najib. <laughs> a- any other questions uh, from the, the previous podcast? Refer to this comment. We Malaysia should consider giving land certificates to Bumi Putra landowners. Uh, this is based on the book The Mystery of Capital by Hernando de Soto. For example, most land ownership of Sarawakian Bumi Putra is under Tana Adat, and this makes the landowner not able to uh, attain capital, you know, not able to capitalize uh, the land as collateral if let's say he or she wants to start a business and so on and so forth. So yeah, uh, whereas uh, you're, when you're talking about people in the city area, most of their properties are already registered, they have that land title. So to, to make it simple, what this Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto advocates for is that in a lot of economies where the informal sector is very big, where land rights are not very well defined, if you just give the land certificate to uh, somebody, in this case it would be Sabah or Sarawakian or uh, other Bumi Putra landowners, they can actually use that to uh, as a form of wealth and use that to to um, um, you know get in, that get themselves involved in other 
types of businesses, for example, mm. to get mm. to use it as collateral, collateral for loans. loans and stuff like that, right? Yeah. So yeah. you know, this is uh, I think something that uh, is worthwhile uh, yeah. to to explore. Actually, that's a very good idea because it also encourages uh, financial inclusion, right? When we talk about it, yes. one of the main reason a lot of banks can't give you loan is because you you can't justify the collaterals and stuff like that. And and we know that there are many orang asal, especially right, like. Um, I've I've been hearing a lot of uh, very interesting stories from them. Like, yeah, they are told that this land is theirs, but there's no clear documentation that this land mm. is theirs. And so when let's say certain developers or whoever want to come and buy the land, right? Mm. And it gets really interesting. Sometimes the negotiation is, berapa pokok ada sana yang kurang collect uh, 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 your uh, uh, fruits? Uh, then they will pay by three. They pay by three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh. so I was like, yeah. wow, your three acre land got five three and then uh. you koya. Yeah, yeah, then they okay. like. Yeah, yeah, betul. But <laughs> but they they are so helpless. Mm. They will just accept. Uh, and because uh, it is quick cash. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I I think having that grant uh, will actually encourage them to actually think deeper because at least now I got something at hand, right? Yeah. I also can go to the bank and compare. Sure. Uh, uh, but for, but it's not so easy because uh, you know when you talk about tanah adat, it's usually owned as a collective, lah. Yeah. Uh, so you know it's good to have collective ownership because then you'll be able to plan for the community long term uh, rather than let's say just uh, you know individual parcels that can be easily s- uh, sold and then uh, you know you've lost your family's wealth already mm. and your your family's assets lah. so yeah I mean you know we can have a much more substantive discussion on this uh, on things like a wakaf land for example uh, among the Muslim community uh, that can also be an important uh, you know land asset that can be owned by Uh, the Bumi Putra, uh, specifically the Malay community. Mm. La. So, yeah, watch this space. We may invite an expert later on to come and talk about these issues. La. So, yeah. for those of you, if you like us to go to Sarawak, uh, maybe you like to host us or maybe you are a business there or maybe you are someone who lives there and you want to share with us what's happening, just write down there in the comments, say Sarawak, and then uh, reach out to us as well. Mm. Maybe we'll arrange a date where we go down there pay some visit to the industrial areas and also the kampung areas and to understand how things truly are and show you guys there as well. Yeah, before we go for a break, once again, thanks to Zeus Coffee for uh, supplying today's coffee. So thank you very much, Zeus Coffee, for sponsoring this episode as well. And for those of you guys, if you find yourself craving for coffee, go and check them out. Uh, one of my favorite is the Hot CEO Latte and I personally like it in almond milk. Mm. Okay, we'll be right back after this. Hi, welcome back to the Are We Okay podcast. So, Peter, I think uh, one of the hottest issues now in the press and in social media uh, is the issue of uh, these uh, socks that were sold uh, at KK Mart where they w- it was discovered there were five pairs that had the name uh, Allah on it, which I know uh, is uh, very d- deeply offensive to the Muslim community uh, because, uh, you know, the word Allah, you know, spelled out in different Uh, you know, uh, Arabic f- uh, fonts and whatnot is something that's very sacred. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so you know, for you to get displayed in any sort of like a uh, place uh, where it's like commercialized uh, is something that I think is 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 a no go lah. Mm. Uh, so I I you know from what I've read, uh, you know KK Mart has apologized. The 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 CEO and the founder has come out to apologize, and the latest is that uh, they've also put in these apology notices in all of their stores around around Malaysia. Uh, at the same time, they also have discontinued uh, the the manufacture of the socks, uh, uh, and the distributor of those socks is a, a company in based in Batu Pahat, and that company, that Kilang also, that factory, uh, they've also put out a banner apologizing to the Malaysian uh, public uh, who have been offended by this issue. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, before we go into some of the the intricacies in terms of the personalities, what what was what is your take on on this issue? At first, I was thinking to myself like, not too big deal. But after that, I realized, hey, because it's on the sock, right? Mm. So then it's on the leg ground. Yeah. So mm. all the more there's that element yeah. of offense yeah. that that can be interpreted that way. Yeah. When I looked at it that time, uh, I was thinking like maybe both sides should refrain a little bit on the comments. Mm. Yeah. Because if you keep commenting too much on this, also it it bruises. Mm. Uh, why not just a simple apology or something like that? Yeah. And uh, for for the other parties also to accept an apology gracefully mm. and give out a stern warning kind of things. Sure. Yeah. I, I, again, I I apologize if let's say any of this information may not be uh, accurate. The way they look at let's say the Quran uh, and the way the Christians look at the Bible is actually very different. So I'll give an example: mm. the Quran, the book itself, the holy book, cannot be put on the ground because that is something that 
shows that you know you are you are insulting the word of God. Right. 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 Whereas you know for 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 Christians, you know, uh, I'm a Christian, uh, and when we go for Bible study and things like that, you know, it's very common for us to put the Bible on the ground, yes. to put it close to our feet and things like yes. that. Yes. Right. So then you you can see that there's a very big difference in how we view these mm, uh, two mm. holy uh, scriptures. You know, and I think for for the the non-Muslims may, who may say, hey. Uh, why are you making such a big deal out of this? Of this, uh, I, I think you should also try to look at things uh, from from the other side. Uh. Yeah. yeah, actually, I think when when it comes to the Islamic religion itself, right, and uh, many religion, there's this thing about the physical thing will represent yeah manifestation uh, of, a manifestation yeah. of that holiness, right? Yes. And therefore, you don't do certain things. With it. It's kind of like to a certain extent, also for Chinese lah, you don't. <laughs> You don't go and uh, you don't disrespect the quan. Yeah, you don't. Uh, or, yeah, you, you, don't you don't kick. You don't go and kick the altar. You yeah, know, yeah, or you yeah, don't correct. put your feet inside the altar. That kind of thing, right? Uh, there are certain these kind of boundaries that you need to keep to. And mm. I think, yeah, sometimes for uh, especially people who are non-religious, uh, it's a little bit hard to understand. But the truth is that's how it is, lah. Sure. Yeah. And and of course that that is something that the larger Muslim community feels very strongly about. Uh, I think it's good that. That the KK Mart has done all these things to show it's uh, deeply, uh, you know, uh, deeply apologetic and deeply sorry for such a thing. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we can't ignore the politics and the personalities, uh-huh. So I would say the person who has sort of like uh, made a name for himself the most uh, out of this uh, particular controversy <laughs> uh, is the the youth chief of uh, Amno, Pemuda uh, uh, Pemuda Amno. Uh, none other than Dr. Akmal Saleh, who is a uh, adun for Melimau in Malacca and also a member of the Malacca ex uh, So he has come out very strongly, uh, you know, even uh, in the face of criticisms from, uh, you know, um, three ministers, uh, you know, from the uh, youth chief of uh, DAP, you know, Dr. Kelvin Yee. Uh, you know, he has used this opportunity to respond back to show that he is the the hero of this uh, episode lah. So here's where uh, I I have that you know that does it really need to it seems that Malaysia politics still can't run away from trying to be ultra nationalist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So mm-hmm. this is where I have that question. But I'm trying to tread this <coughs> I'll, I'll be upfront. I'm trying to tread this topic very carefully. Mm-hmm. I know some of you all will write in the yes. comment there and say hey Peter seems like you don't want to you try and say everything politically correct. Mm. Uh, you I'll just be upfront. Yes, I'm trying to be mm. politically yeah, correct. You should be, you should yeah. be. Yeah, it's a very sensitive because it's issue. It's a very sensitive topic, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that is the thing if you were to ask me. You see, um politicians are still politicians. La. They want to be out there, to be seen for certain things, to be known for certain things. Uh, you know, sometimes it's uh, you know, for is something that they they work towards, uh, is strategic, sometimes it's by accident. Right? So uh you know, the strategic ones would be, you think about it. Lah. Um, if you think about um, MPs last time in the opposition who used to speak a lot about 1MDB, right? You would think of Tony Poa, you think of Rafizi Ramli, right? You know, so that was their branding. Mm. Uh, if you if you think of, let's say, uh, former, uh, you know, Amno Youth Chief Hishamuddin uh, Hussein, uh, many non-Malays would remember him for always raising the craze and, you know, oh, uh, trying to yeah, instigate, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. certain reactions from the larger public. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, one of the reasons why there was a big swing uh, among the non-Malay, especially the Chinese voters, uh, against MC and BN in 2008, the, the 2008 general elections. La. Right. So I, I think this is something that I think Dr. Akmal has uh, cleverly, uh, you know, uh, sort of like uh, used to increase and, and uh, raise his own profile. Uh, I think, uh, you know, you can see how he understands the larger political landscape, uh, even uh, some members of the royalty have uh, come out to express uh, their deep concern on this particular issue. Mm. So, you know, it will be interesting to see whether uh, Dr. Akmal will be seen in public with some of the members of the royalty who have expressed uh, these views uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, But yeah, I mean, uh, you know, he's clearly one of the sort of like uh, big beneficiaries, if you will, from this episode. Right. So do you think this is a uh, planned out kind of thing or do you think it's a accidental... I think uh, there were many issues that Dr. Amal Akmal was trying to capitalize on, trying to gain traction on, uh, including, for example, criticizing uh, YB Nga Koming on the UNESCO uh, listing proposal for the Chinese new villages. Uh, 
Uh, but that one, a lot of other people also chime in to to criticize. But I think for this particular issue, he he came out very strongly, and then he's capitalized on the reaction uh, that were that was being uh, you know that that was uh, issued you know press statements that were issued uh, press conference that were had where some of the non Malay leaders uh, sort of like uh, called him out and took him to task lah. I'm talking mm. about. Uh, YB Tiong King Singh, the MP for the the Minister for Tourism, uh, YB Nga, you know or that there's I think certainly some bad blood between them. Uh, Anthony has also come out I think with quite a, a reasonable response, but you know that 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 will uh, be be used uh, by Dr Akmal to escalate his own level of importance. Uh, yeah, so you know when when you read the response of some of these uh, non Malay uh, leaders, uh, you know against uh, on on this particular issue, what what is your reaction? You know. So here's where I want to ask you back, actually, mm-hmm. because uh, how would you rate their response? Actually, mm. like out of all three of them, uh, mm. or four of them, yeah, mm. who sure, do sure. you think gave the best response? Okay, uh, I think that you know the appropriate level of response uh, should have come from uh, Dr. Kelvin Yee, and he did issue a response because he is also DAP Youth Chief. So you are sort of like uh, oh, reacting at the same level, oh. right? To say, look, let's let's calm things down. Let's uh, have a fruitful dialogue about this. Uh, even you know uh, somebody like uh, the Dun Adun for Bugi Gasing, uh, Doctor uh, not Doctor but Rajiv, uh, he uh, had actually a sit down session with uh, Doctor Akmal a couple of weeks back to talk about the Bumi Putra uh, Economic Congress issues mm. So you know, I think things could have been maybe resolved uh, at that level. Uh, but I think because Doctor Akmal escalated up, uh, made the temperature very very hot. Uh. So that's when I think the other ministers felt they had to come in and, and right. chime in. Uh, I, 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 I know why they had to do it uh, because they also had to be seen to be uh, defending. You know, defending certain certain uh, certain grounds and certain uh, areas of uh, you know uh, certain supporters that would have a certain view of yes. this issue. Uh, but that also allows Dr. Akmal to increase his own that's right. uh, his own uh, yeah. Uh, popularity in this That's area. Right. Yeah, so during the same time, actually what I did notice is, um, so when it comes to the Chinese papers, yeah, uh, when they reported on uh, Wai Binga's comments, mm. it was more of in that tone of, oh, he is fighting against uh, extremism. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, mm. and when it comes to the more uh, English papers, it was more of a dramatizing both ends, mm, just mm. to see how mm. the news Standard lah, mm. right? Yeah. Then when it comes to the more Malay side, it is more of uh, protecting the religion. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I, that is when I can see like suddenly there's this different markets, different market. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, market segmentation. Yeah, market segmentation, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. they're really playing into the market. Mm. Yeah. Um. And here is where right? I do not know whether is it um, uh, why being us face itself tend to look fierce. Mm. So maybe even when certain things that he say is actually if you look at the words itself. It's nothing too offensive to mm. a certain extent, yeah, yeah. but maybe it's a facial expression. <laughs> I, I also think I also think that the newspaper editors are very smart, lah. They use certain pictures to highlight certain, yes. uh, you know, uh, highlight certain points or to accentuate certain points that are in the the report, lah. The yes, reporting, yes, la. yeah, that's right. right. So perhaps uh, maybe some of the Malay papers they will feature Wabinga, you know, in his Chirama style, yeah. very garang, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so maybe Chinese papers, uh, you know, uh, more Qing Ming, more uh, sort of like a friendly to the people kind of a, a phase. So yeah, I mean, this is also part and parcel of editorial politics uh, on the uh, on the part of newspapers. Right, right. Yeah. So um, I, I I think this issue, you know, I, the the uh, prime minister has come out to ask everyone to uh, remain calm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the investigation by the police is uh, you know currently ongoing. Uh, I hope you know by by the time you listen to this episode uh, next week, uh, the the temperature on this issue would have uh, you know t- come down a bit. Uh, I think Dr. Akmal has already made his point. He's already gotten his uh, his uh, his press coverage. Uh, enough of the 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 you know non Malay leaders have spoken up on this as well. Uh, and I hope that because PM has spoken up and also the AMNO president uh, Zaid Hamidi has spoken up on this issue, asking people to you know uh, be more calm. 
hopefully that can tone down the temperature of this uh, debate as well. Yeah. So yeah, because it's it 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 doesn't really contribute to the economy. That's <laughs> right. Know, we have enough boycotts That's going on right. as it is That's already. Right. You know, we don't need another yeah. boycott. Uh, you know, to 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 affect uh, dip, uh ha- affect not just businesses but the employees as well. That's right. Yeah. So here's yeah. where it leads me to the 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 last part of it in the more economic side. Right. Mm. Does it actually affect investors' confidence? I think if let's say you you have a succession of events that are happening of this nature, where it not only gets covered in the national news but also the international news, and I believe that mm. after a while the international newspapers will pick it up uh, because this is uh, you know something that uh, that they will be interested to to highlight. Uh, and if let's say there are other inc- incidences that get picked up in the uh, foreign newspapers as well uh, and the news wires. Uh, it will start to give a bit of a negative narrative to potential investors, lah. Right. Uh, although I think you know, in the larger scheme of things, uh, you know, the the job that Miti is doing right now is uh, very very good, and we can we can talk more about the trip that PM made to Germany later. But yeah, it will have an effect as long as it doesn't prolong too much and uh, it quickly dies down, <laughs> dampens down, uh, yeah. dampens down, and then settle with an understanding. Then hopefully it will uh, not affect. The economy, lah. Huh? Last question that I have, right? Hmm. Take us back to the, take us back behind the curtain a little bit. As a politician, ex-politician yourself, right? Hmm. How do you balance between like, um, you know, there's this need for the non-boomies to actually say that like, hey, you should be protecting our rights as well, and then for the boomies to say that, hey, protect my rights as well, or hmm. whoever races is there, lah, right? Hmm. How do we balance between these two things when one is a politician? Because like like in your case, you are considered one of the very neutral ones where often don't talk about this. Have you ever gotten a comment, right, where people say like, you see, you you never fight for our rights also? Mm. Different politicians would come to this issue from different angles. La. So if let's say I was still active in frontline politics in the DAP, uh, I would come from it, uh, you know, from the perspective of uh, being an MP for, let's say, Bangi, that is a majority uh, Muslim. Uh, and I would try to have some sort of a dialogue session where I can uh, you know, give room for those uh, Muslim NGOs in my area to voice out their uh, concerns about this issue. Uh, you know, it can be a different spectrum. It can be somebody who is really very angry. It can be somebody who is a little bit more uh, you know, um, uh, reason, but explaining in very uh, sort of like a new, uh, very... Um, not very heated terms, uh, you know, to, to explain to the public, uh, you know, why, especially to the non-Malay community, why this issue is so, so hung up. Lah. And then at the same time, uh, you know, I probably want to do something at the local level uh, to say that, look, uh, you know, KK Mart, these, all these places, they've already put up their apologies uh, and, uh, you know, maybe interview some of the customers and say, you know, um, especially the Malay customers to say that, you know, is this okay? You know, um, are you, can you accept this? Maybe do some CSR at the local level to show that you know we are also helping, let's say the B40 community doing a puasa man as well to help mm-hmm. them with buka puasa meals and stuff like that. So try to find points where we can engage at the local level to to uh, to try to de-escalate this issue. Right, yeah, right. That's, that would be what probably I would have done. I see. Then uh, will you? How will you deal with the? media side of things hmm. because I also noticed that these card issues tend to be a great place for many politicians to capitalize hmm. on their on their target market right yep. so yeah. all those things that I, that I said I would do I would invite the media to come oh. hmm. either that or I will have a, you know YouTube or some sort of Facebook post some sort right. of video clip to get and show what's happening right. uh, and get the stakeholders together even in let's say the dialogue session uh, we can get uh, you know the, the regional or the, the state uh, KK Mart person to come in, uh, you know, to to try to uh, explain things, uh, and and also maybe some of the staff lah to say that you know we uh, we uh, you know are sorry that this happened and uh, to say that actually KK Mart is a good place uh, that serves the local community, gives good pricing, uh, has a lot of uh, Bumi Putra and Malay uh, staff as well uh, that uh, you know are well treated within the mm. company, and then you you show showcase that to the media. So that that it would be my media statement. Uh. you don't need to ask me about what my right, position right. is. You just look at what I do. But but isn't it also quite dangerous? Because uh? I also noticed like media has this thing that's quite annoying, right? Is mm. that they like to pick out the part that are very sensational. No, because that's the easiest. <laughs> that's the easiest thing to do. To do what I suggested just now, right? Requires a lot of work on the ground, and also you must have the trust of the local community for them to be able to want to engage you uh, uh, knowing that you are not going to make this into a political issue that would be disadvantageous uh, and, and also 
put different people in in, in mm, bad light. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, yeah. Because so, actually, the truth is that at at right level, this is what I think. I think actually many people are quite like religious. We are quite peaceful, reasonable. Yes. Quite reasonable, yes. right? So uh, if you make your apology, I think you know in a way that's that's very contrite, uh, which I think Kiki Mart has done. Uh, I think you know most uh, Malays uh, would be, you know, they, they, they're quite forgiving and be able to say, look at this and say, okay, I think that's sincere. Maybe let's not politicize the issue any further, and you know, let's 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 move on and address some of the larger economic concerns that the that Malaysia is facing, and let us, in the spirit of um, uh, Ramadan, let us uh, mm. let let us forgive. Not asking you to forget, but forgive, uh, and then you know have that kind of more compassionate uh, tone of uh, discussion, lah. But but I have to say this, lah. Uh, I I think it would be very difficult for me, uh, in my position, to actually say what Muslims should think about this issue. I would yeah. not want to put myself in that yeah. position, lah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't say you know, oh, you you should not take this so seriously, or you should. Uh, you know, it's a small matter. You know, that, that that's not for me to say as a non-Muslim. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think that's something that we need to to be careful about. Yeah. This one, this one, I agree. Yeah. I think th- this part to say it is not because we are trying to be politically correct or anything, but but I think it's real, right? I I don't think anyone should come to me and tell me what I should think in my position. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Whether as a businessman, whether as a Chinese, or whether as a Malaysian, or whether as a oh, but father, but no, no, you know, if somebody somebody can tell you that, but you you be pissed off with that person, correct? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so so it, it's it like what local standard yeah, do you correct. have? Uh. Yeah, so it, like like I'm a Christian, right? Yeah, mm. so the same thing also. Like sometimes when there are certain issues that happen, they say hey, you all shouldn't think like that. Uh. Hey, bro, how you how you know why? Uh. Why should think or shouldn't think? Correct. So correct, correct. it's not about being politically correct. It's uh. really that's the how you. You treat others how you want others to treat you, and That's try all. to put yourself in the shoes of others, uh, la, You know, yeah. so, same thing for I think uh, issues that maybe, uh, you know, the non-Muslim community may take a little bit more yeah. sensitively, la, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, we'll be right back. Okay, welcome back to the final segment of the Are We Okay podcast. Uh, Peter, we're gonna talk about something a little bit lighter. I'm gonna talk about uh, PM's first trip to Europe. Uh, he visited Germany for four or five days, mm. uh, accompanied by a couple of ministers: the foreign minister, the Miti minister, the minister for entrepreneurship uh, and uh, cooperative deve- development, uh, YB Iwan uh, Benedict. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I mean, from your reading of the news, how do you think the trip went? Yeah. Oh, sounds great! Uh, every time uh, our greatest salesman go out. He sure bring back uh, good things for Malaysia, right? Mm. Yeah. Investment numbers. Investment number, bi- fantastic. Yeah. 46 billion in potential investment. That's right. I also get to follow uh, Tengku Zafro's uh, post on how he posts as James Bond in front ah. of that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I always like to follow his social media. Yes, yes, yes. Very, very entertaining. I mean, and, yes, very, <laughs> and also how he walked with the PM. Yes. And then when the PM is no, no, not around, he runs, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I'm more interested uh, on what you know about it because you are also on the Danish Chamber of Commerce, right? Which is part yes. of this whole EU thing, yeah? So yes, yeah. So I'm a board member of the Danish Chamber of Commerce uh, and, uh, you know, the uh, this the Danish Chamber is also part and parcel of the larger European Chambers mm. of Commerce. So for those of you who don't know, um, European companies, uh, if you take them as a collective, they are the second largest investor in Malaysia. Uh, the largest country would be uh, Singapore uh, by, by quite far and this is cumulative, uh. Right, so the other large players would be the Americans, the Japanese, uh, you know, now China also uh, coming into the picture. Uh, but for European companies, and uh, you know, what they uh, you know are looking forward to uh, beyond the visit, which I think is a good start, uh, are for more substantive ties to be uh, developed, uh, formal and institutional ties uh, between uh, Europe as well as as well as uh, you know Malaysia. Uh, so you know. Uh, one of the good things that I think came up from this uh, visit was that the PM announced that Malaysia is interested to restart uh, EU-Malaysia free trade agreement talks. Mm. Uh, and I think that's very important because uh, you know Vietnam has already signed the FTA with the EU and Vietnam is also a member of the CPTPP uh, free trade agreement. So when companies invest, they would think about this advantage that Vietnam has. Uh, Indonesia is currently uh, in talks with the EU for an FTA. And then uh, the Philippines and Thailand have also indicated interest. So, you know, Malaysia would be, uh, you know, uh, putting its name into the hat. And it's not guaranteed that, e- that the EU would uh, accept, although I think yep. they do want to because of 
the strategic uh, position that Malaysia plays uh, in global trade, uh, probably more important than the Philippines uh, in some ways, uh, you know. Uh, but yeah, so with that uh, that interest, what I'm hoping will happen is that there can be a cabinet decision made on this issue that, you know, cabinet give approval to restart uh, this EU Malaysia FTA talks. And then, uh, then that com message will also be communicated to the, uh, to the EU commission who handles all these FTA negotiations. And then uh, something positive hopefully can be announced within the next uh, maybe two months. Or so. Right. Yeah. So maybe before we move on uh, for the whole topic, right? Yeah, maybe you want to explain to the audience uh, how a free trade agreement works and yeah. what are the benefits of being a part of it. Sure. So in the past, free trade agreements uh, at the more basic level basically means that if you have an FTA with another country, your tariffs on most of the products will be reduced uh, either to zero immediately or following a schedule. Mm. Right. So it means that, let's say if uh, uh, the EU is importing palm oil um, from Malaysia, uh, you know, the, the tariff rate may be 10% now. Uh, but with the EU FTA, uh, that tariff rate may go down to 5 and go down to 0. Then we can export more palm oil uh, to uh, the, the EU. Mm. Uh, of course, they also uh, the, the good thing about these kinds of FTAs is that because it's a high-level FTA, a good quality uh, FTA, there will also be other things that will be discussed. So for example, uh, you know what kind of uh, environmental regulations, what kind of labor regulations. And right now, Whatever the EU decides, you know, at the commission level, their civil service, uh, let's say on something that's quite controversial in Malaysia, the EU deforestation regulations, uh, Malaysia doesn't really have any say in how these things are, are drafted, how the policies are, are crafted. Uh, but, you know, in the context of a FTA discussion, then Malaysia can say, look, you know, uh, why not have more provisions to allow uh, access for, let's say, Malaysian uh, sustainable palm oil certified uh, you know, palm oil to be uh, exported to the EU uh, in ways that uh, would reflect the fact that these palm oil come from non-deforested uh, sources, mm. la, right? So that will also help the conversation when we have these kinds of uh, technical uh, discussions. Uh, and a lot of things that were maybe not in play uh, when you discuss with the commission, when in the context of an FTA, you can. So I'll give you an example also on palm oil. The UK recently joined the CPTPP, right? And as part of the the process of applying for that membership, uh, all the CPTPP countries would have negotiations with the UK government. So one of the things that we negotiated with the UK as part of the agreement to allow them to come into the CPTPP was better recognition and also appreciation of uh, the sustainable palm oil certification in Malaysia, the MSPO. Right? And this was something that was uh, you know, investigated upon by the Trade and Agriculture Commission of the UK. Uh, and the recognition uh, or the appreciation of those high standards that MSPO has uh, among the smallholders, especially, uh, was something that was even reported in that re in a report by the Trade and Agriculture Commission to the UK Parliament, right? So then that becomes a point of a, a, a discussion where uh, you know our we can protect our own sectors and give them the the kind of uh, uh, positive publicity that it deserves, mm. right? Uh, and it may also be a good point to differentiate some of the palm oil that may be coming from our neighbours that may not be so sustainable, <laughs> right? So that's, that's the part, of, part, of, part and parcel of the largest strategic considerations yep. that we have. Yep. Uh, of course, you know, these FTAs, they're complicated. The, the other side will also want to have some concessions uh, that, that, that we have to uh, look into. Mm. Uh, and this is where I think we need to have a strong negotiation, ne negotiating team. Uh, we need to have an all-of-government approach to see how we can find win-win solutions for all of the parties involved. Mm. La. So yeah. another FTA that I think is almost concluding already is with the uh, European Free Trade Area. These are the countries that are not part of the EU, uh, but also wants to have uh, free trade agreements with uh, different uh, countries and regions. Right. Uh, this would be uh, Norway, Switzerland, uh, Liechtenstein, very small country, and Iceland. So I want to ask, right, if let's say Malaysia has a free trade agreement, let's say with, with uh, EU, right? Mm. Uh, but let's say I do not have a free trade agreement, let's say with Norway. Mm. But Norway have another free trade agreement with EU, right? So does it kind of like link everyone together or does it not? It has to be individual. I put it in a way that uh, will let you see how Malaysia can benefit. So for example, India is not part of RCEP, uh, mm. the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, but it has a free trade agreement with uh, ASEAN. Uh, not a very high quality one, uh, but it's still there. 
So, uh, and also Malaysia is part of uh, CPTPP. If let's say I was an Indian investor, uh, I know my government is not going to make any significant moves in terms of FTA uh, liberalization, uh, but I want to expand my business, right? Am I going to come to, let's say I, and I want to come to Southeast Asia, in choosing between, let's say, uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Thailand, right? I would also consider uh, not just the business environment, but also the FTA environment. If I want to access the European market, okay, Vietnam, I can do it through CPS, through C, through uh, through the, the, the Vietnam EU FTA. If I want to use that to access the RCEP market, Vietnam has that, right? If I want to access uh, Canada and Mexico, CPTPP countries, Vietnam has that, mm. right? Whereas Malaysia, uh, we are now part of RCEP. Uh, we are part of CPTPP. Thailand is not part of CPTPP. Vietnam is. Uh, so we have the advantage over Thailand. Mm. Right? But we don't have the EU Malaysia angle. Mm. Right? So the more free trade agreements we have, I think the more strategic Malaysia will be in terms of being able to compete with our some of our neighbors. Uh, and at the same time, I think uh, you know what what MITI, what the government needs to do more of, right, is to show how these FTAs can actually benefit the SMEs. Yeah. Right. So for most SMEs, they would not know that CPTPP now allows them to export to uh, Mexico to uh, Canada, uh, to Peru, three countries that we didn't have uh, FTAs with previously. And Mexico is a you know, OECD country, top 20 economy in the world. Canada is a uh, you know, G7 country, top 10 in the world. Right? So how then do we want to bring our SMEs to these places to, to introduce them to the ecosystem, to work with our counterparts in Canada and Mexico to see how the SMEs can benefit from this uh, free trade agreement and the supply chains that it will create. Uh. Mm, right? Because mm. I can tell you, you know, Chinese companies are setting up shop in Mexico uh, to take advantage of the CPTPP and also the Canada, uh, US and uh, Mexico free trade uh, agreement. Yeah, yeah, they call it the Mexico Canada America uh, agreement. This was uh, renegotiated under Trump. It's called MCA lah. So Malaysians <laughs> would, would know how to uh, remember this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so okay. uh, hope that under, hope that explains yeah. the FTA is a little bit clear. Uh, That's you know, right. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. kind of like the it, it's kind of like you, you want to set yourself as the the network hub for. Yeah, a place like that. that can I ask yeah. you uh, this uh, trick question? La. Actually, it's not, not that tricky. Um, in, in Southeast Asia, which country do you think has the most FTAs? I think Singapore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Open trading nation. Correct. They need this kind of ecosystem. And, uh, yeah, That's why everyone go there and build HQ. La. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> I, I think even those companies that are going to Singapore, uh, the financial hub will be there. Yes. Uh, but they're also realizing that Malaysia has other other advantages. Like, That's right. Yeah, yeah. So some of those activities can be mm. actually near short to to uh, to Malaysia, mm. you know, to the Klang Valley and maybe under some of the SCZ provisions as well. Let's go back a little bit to that uh, EU trip mm. that uh, yeah, PMX, of Pro and PM and this, yeah. went, right? Uh, yeah. They announced something about Germany, right? Uh, Germany is going to be uh, potentially investing in Malaysia uh, quite a lot of money as mm. usual. Yeah, uh, and this time around... Uh, Compared to every time in the newspaper, uh, it's MOU, everything. This time, they just say potential. Mm. Yeah. Correct, correct. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I think uh, it's also to address some of the criticisms that people have said uh, that, oh, these are not realized investments. Like, these are just potential investments. But I think it's still a good trajectory uh, in terms of uh, MITI showcasing what uh, it has done in the past and what it continues to do uh, You know, through agencies like MIDA, which I'm a board member of. Uh, but I think maybe just to add on a little bit, I think um, what would be good is during these kinds of uh, trade missions uh, or these kinds of uh, visits, um, there can be a larger agenda, either directly involving PM's visit or follow-up. So I'll give you an example. Germany is very well known for its TVET ecosystem. Yes. Apprenticeship and whatnot. And this is something that we want to develop. Yes. Why not bring this as part of the agenda? Yeah. Right. Why not say that, look, we want to have a better TVET ecosystem. Uh, DPM, Zai Hamidi, he's the person who has been tasked with overseeing this. Why not you know, communicate publicly and privately to the German government to yes. say that uh, the TPM will be bringing another delegation to talk about TVET. He'll bring the Minister of Education, Minister of Higher Education, and then we can have a separate uh, a follow-up conversation on, on this. Mm. Then you can see the strategic uh, and long-term plan being put there uh, and hopefully it can be institutionalized yeah. so that these things can 
have a leg, uh, you know, um, uh, beyond uh, the term of this government, yeah. for example. So when they actually put up the the specifically when I saw the news regarding the German one, uh, what caught my attention immediately was actually German Malaysian institution. Sure, sure. G- uh, uh, right. GMI. GMI, like, yeah. right. The, yeah. One of the most well-known Tibet institution in Malaysia. I think even though the German name is still there, uh, just to let you and our audience know, uh, most of the sort of like, uh, you know, technical assistance and expertise, capacity building that was uh, given to the institute at the beginning of this cooperation, uh, you know, that that's no longer the case. And, and it's fine, you know, sometimes we need to have that localization process. La. But it will still be good to have some sort of connection with, let's say, some of the German technical institutions, right? TV mm. institutions, so that there can be, uh, you know, exchange of ideas, exchange yes. of students, exchange of uh, lecturers and academics. Uh, but, you know, usually what will happen is that after the initial fanfare of setting up something like this, as long as the management uh, of these institutions are not uh, really, uh, you know, up to par, you know, or not, not uh, aggressive enough, right? Uh, most of the time, the number of students will dwindle. Mm. Uh, the kind of activities they have will also dwindle. Then the whole business model gets undermined. Yeah, yeah. So I I hope that you know there can be, uh, you know, with this visit, maybe other uh, partners can come in to try to revive this uh, German yeah. Malaysian institute. They're actually still very keen at the point like, pre-COVID time mm. They were they were very keen, and they see a lot of potential in actually continuing this and making it even bigger. But they were saying that they face a lot of challenges. Mm. Like uh, one of it is the fragmented implementation yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. it seems like every so single is under institutions yeah, yeah. <laughs> and all are under different ministry and so on right mm. so they were saying that like wow it's a nightmare to actually go through it mm. yeah and but they are very open to it and I personally think that you know with all these FDIs coming in I, I mean we've got no no problem with it in fact attending the bank I think they also did uh, say that uh, the government has already smoothened up a lot of uh, registration and stuff like that. So mm. actually, a lot of the FDIs that came in between, I think, 2019 or, uh, to 2023 or something like that. Mm. Yeah, th- that one came from, uh, come from MIDA anyway, the mm. statistics. So yeah. you should know better than me. Yeah. Uh, about 74% were actually already under implementation yeah, at this uh, point. will be actualized. Yeah. Then, yeah. So yeah. They, they were saying that it's, it's very good numbers. Yeah, I can see that the government is trying to hasten all this to let it come through faster and stuff like that. Mm. Uh then it makes me think about the next part, right? With German coming in, uh, actually, and then now we're talking about, you know, uh, building German sky in Malaysia, right? Uh, Porsche, you know, and stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. Are we, Mercedes and BMW, uh, they're already quite active. I think we would benefit from their TVET system. I mean, is that uh, having it a much more involvement? Be- Be- because better, better coordinated. Yeah, because yeah. TVET is an... in The whole TVET education is about coming out straight away into the industry itself. Uh, and there's a lot of involvement when it comes to the business side of it, okay, right? So, so this is where, again, pull you behind the curtain a bit. Uh, if you look at the way, you know, uh, the Singapore government does things, la, they are very strategic. Not all of it, I think, is uh, 100% long-term until 50 years or whatnot. Uh, but in terms of engagement with a lot of their important trading partners, uh, there's a game plan la, uh, in terms of the kind of uh, people and institutes they want to engage with. So if, let's say, uh, you know, the PM makes a visit, then there will be a coordination team uh, and unit within the Prime Minister's office that will say, okay, who else needs to follow up on that? Who are the people that uh, needs to uh, go and explore and, and uh, see what they can uh, get out of the ecosystem? Right? So the, that coordination cannot be done by METI. It has to be done by the Prime Minister's office. Mm. Yep. So, uh, you know, um, maybe the Prime Minister's office you know, it's still a little bit new, you know, one plus years, yeah. the kind of strategic uh, muscles may not be so concrete. Uh, hopefully that can improve over time. One last thing to add here, it was quite funny when uh, Tunku Zafro's flight uh, was cancelled, I think, uh, <laughs> because of some some union strikes or all that. And then he had to, uh, uh, you know, adjust and then took a took a train, I think, from, uh, from Germ- Germany to France. Uh, that also shows me that, you know, number one, I think, uh, you know, uh, we are fortunate in the sense that union disruptions are not so... Uh, present here in Malaysia yeah. and then number two uh, you know they have actually a very good train system in Europe <laughs> <laughs> yeah. maybe we should get Tengku Zafro one day on the show uh, uh, we'll talk about uh, sure, sure. Stuff, uh. yeah, yeah. yeah, but maybe uh, there may be other uh, you know other guests that are maybe more willing to come so watch this space <laughs> uh, you know af- after the, the interview with Azwan I think uh, there will be more opportunities to invite more corporate guests more political guests uh, you know, people from the NGO sector to talk about uh, specific issues. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so thanks so much for your continued support. Uh, please click on the subscribe button if you've gotten this far. I'm sure you already subscribed to us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next episode of the Are We Okay podcast. See you next week.